This program is brought to you by Emory University. Ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and begin the next session. The Curry Lectures in Law and Religion were a lecture series created 15, almost 20 years ago now, Woody, I think, by the O. Anderson Curry, Overton Curry, and his family and as an early contribution to our work in law and religion. We've had annual Curry Lectures on a variety of topics from a very broad range of outstanding scholars. I'm delighted that today two of the finest scholars in the country are participating in the Curry Lecture Series that is part of this. The session is chaired by my colleague, my dean, my provost, my president, Howard O. Hunter, or Woody Hunter. Woody joined the Emory Law School faculty in 1976 served as dean for over a decade, 12 years, dean here at Emory Law School, then provost of Emory University, and is currently the president of Singapore Management University. Woody, I suspect, traveled further than anyone else here in coming 10,000 miles home to help be a part of this conference. Woody, welcome back. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, Although this is probably John's uh, responsibility, I'm going to take it over for a moment and tell you that because lunch ran over a little bit, we will have a shorter coffee break this afternoon between sessions. John, if I've done wrong, I'll take back your tenure. <laughs> this afternoon, we're having two uh, splendid and luminary speakers for the Overton Curry Lectures. The first to speak this afternoon will be Professor Jean Bethke Elstein, who is the Laura Spellman Rockefeller Professor of Social and Political Ethics at the University of Chicago, a position she's held for more than a decade. She's also taught at the University of Massachusetts and at Vanderbilt University and has been a visiting professor at Harvard and Yale. She holds nine honorary degrees and is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a prolific author who has had more essays than one can hardly count and has authored or edited 20 books, including Just War Against Terror, The Burden of American Power in a Violent World, and Jane Addams and the Dream of American Democracy. She's also a contributing editor for The New Republic. Professor Elstein. Thank you very much. I realize it's uh, part of my task to help us stay awake uh, after lunch, uh, so I hope I'll succeed in doing that. Uh, thank you so much for the uh, generous introduction. It is an honor to share the stage with the distinguished Judge Noonan. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity. I told John Witte that I probably would say a few things that were politically incorrect, and he said, I'm deeply shocked. You've never done that before, and I said, I know, but it's possible I'll do it this time. So with that, uh, let me begin. One of the most eloquent defenses of law in the dramatic theater is put into the mouth of St. Thomas More by the playwright Robert Bolt. Realizing that his life may well be in jeopardy, given the latest moves by King Henry VIII against the church for not granting him a divorce, More speaks to his daughter Meg, and his hot-headed son-in-law, Roper. Moore, what would you do? Cut a great road through the law to get to the devil? Roper, I'd cut down every law in England to do that. Moore, oh, and when the law, the last law was down and the devil turned round on you, where would you hide, Roper, the laws all being flat? This country is planted thick with laws from coast to coast, man's laws, not God's, and if you cut them down, do you really think you could stand upright in the winds that would blow then? Yes, 
I'd give the devil himself benefit of law for mine own safety's sake. Now, now this is stirring stuff. And to those of us from law-governed societies, such as the United States, a society that does political philosophy, my field, primarily in the form of constitutional law, it is often all or nearly all that needs to be said. Yes, we cheer the rule of law, not of men. It follows that we are loath to take up the possibility that law, or perhaps better put, an excess of legalities, may not so much protect us against tyranny as itself constitute an overbearing structure. This is not, of course, a new worry, but instead a very old one. There are intimations of this worry in St. Thomas Aquinas's Summa Contra Gentilis. St. Thomas, fretting about legal overreach, taxes the law should it pretend that it can read into the human heart, govern interiority, create a kind of moralistic omniscience. St. Thomas no doubt mentions this because Christians may well be tempted in that very direction. Did not Jesus himself talk about the grave sin of lusting in the heart and not just doing the sinful deed? But, Thomas reminds us, only God can see into, pry into human hearts. When human law aims to do so, it is deeply problematic at best and it can become tyrannical at worst. And Moore at his trial in the Robert Bold play, A Man for All Seasons, says to those who are arrayed against him, what you have hunted me for is not my actions, but the thoughts of my heart. It is a long road you have opened. Now, chastening legal overreach that turns law into a tyranny over human beings requires that the law acknowledge that it cannot eliminate or prohibit, in St. Thomas's words, every human action. Because in trying to eliminate evil, it may also do away with many good things. And the interest of the common good, which is necessary for any society, may be adversely affected. Now, tyrannical law, as you know, for St. Thomas is no real law at all, no matter how well-intentioned it may be. Given St. Thomas's high view of the law, and of the law's normative function, his wariness about legal overreach should give us pause. Law is an ordination of reason for the common good. Law helps to habituate human beings to virtue. But again, there are limits. Not every sin is a crime. Not every sin can or should be punished by the civil law. Law, yes. Legalistic overreach, no. Now, surely part of what is going on here is St. Thomas's general Aristotelian approach, roughly, that one's inner world can be transformed as one conforms to worthy norms through processes of habituation. That is, the outer can help to reconfigure the inner. From the point of view of the law, behavior counts for more than intention. Again, because the law cannot probe into human hearts. Only God can do that. Now, I'll be painting in broad strokes for a few moments, but with the coming of Protestantism, one finds, I submit, more stress on interiority, a reaction at times, perhaps an overreaction, to Catholic stress on externalities, on doing, on rituals, on sacraments, and so forth. Protestants, again painting in broad strokes, uh, kept spiritual diaries, engaged in private devotion, emphasized praying in secret, interior transformation, precedes outer behavior, that I finally come to see the light will in turn prompt an alteration in how I act in the world. So the burden of the trajectory seems to move more from inner to outer. Law could not help but be affected by these broad changes in orientation. For St. Thomas, the law aimed at a public or common good, always remembering that earthly dominion was a good but never the summum bonum, the aim of the law was, in the first instance, regulative, to make regular our social relations, to guarantee, if you will, that society not fall below a level of minimal decency. The law could not make us perfect. But how high could it aspire? For St. Thomas, higher than for St. Augustine, who reckoned that we could reach higher than a den of robbers, but perhaps not that much higher most of the time. 
St. Thomas put a stronger stress on the res publica, the public thing, so that the law name aims higher but never at ultimacy or perfection. If the law becomes totalistic, it would make us all into spies and informers, trying to pry into our neighbor's hearts, to look into our neighbor's window, to pay less attention to the moat in our own eyes. So a golden mean of sorts. Do not too readily conflate sins and crimes. Some sins are crimes, but not all are. A looser, a looser social order than what comes later is clearly what St. Thomas works with and knows. This view will no doubt surprise many who continue to see the Middle Ages as a very rigidly structured authoritarian time. But bear in mind that life and work were not yet tied to the clock. The workforce was not yet disciplined in the way it later became. This was before the era of identification cards and all the other insignia of modern identity. And here I would recommend to you Natalie Zeman Davis's wonderful book, The Return of Martin Gare, a uh, great film too, to alert us to the difference between the old, more loosely structured medieval world that is passing and the newer, more law-governed, more regulated, more, if you will, Protestant ordered world that is coming into being. Now the law I submit acquires an even higher normative status, more normative weight with Protestantism. No one has done more to recuperate this history than John Whitty. I think it is fair to say, and I hope that John agrees with me, it'd be terrible if he didn't, but that greater attention was because he, he could out-argue me, I'm sure. The greater attention was paid to human hearts and inner motivation, and not just with the aim of getting to people to behave in certain ways, but in lifting up a higher standard of honor and virtue for ordinary folks. The secular vocations were lifted up, including housewifery and husbandry. The distance between the spiritual and the temporal was reduced. Charles Taylor has called this the affirmation of ordinary life. I called it the redemption of everyday life in my 1991 book, Public Man, Private Woman, and certainly the greater expectation that high standards embodied in law could be attained and sustained as part of that. Now, where's the problem? The problem is this. It is a few short steps, taken no doubt incrementally, from granting the law a high moral and normative purpose to a kind of legal moralism and a quest for a form of totalizing perfectionism. We say concerning nearly every problem and issue, there ought to be a law, and before you know it, there is, and then another, and then another, and then another. And sometimes these laws go way too far. Now let me give you an example from my own experience of 35 years now in the American Academy as a teacher. And my example is going to be sexual harassment codes. Uh, there was a problem, absolutely, how to remedy it. The solution was frequently a stifling overreach based on the presumption that all men, as these, I was there on the ground floor when these things were being debated, were rapists in situ. There was a kind of orthodoxy in the 1970s and 1980s. Women had been told this in text after text, the women who were helping to formulate these codes, that all men were guilty before being charged. All men harbored a desire to rape and to ravish. Thus, Susan Brown Miller, Andrea Dorkin, Mary Daly, Ty Grace Atkinson, Catherine McKinnon, and other legalistic authoritarians. So you could not just regulate behavior and punish infractions, you had to try to arrest every possible bad thought because the assumption was there is a direct un unbroken conduit between a bad thought and an ugly deed given the ontological taint borne by male human beings. That's as if men bore the entire burden of original sin, if you will, and women were the, the morally pure and virtuous victims. Now, do you think I exaggerate? I would ask you to think again and to, and to go back and reread these texts and tracts, many of which are now considered classics and required readings, and read the remedies proposed to fight back the male threat. Thus, Brown Miller, 
all men carry a lust to power that comes out as an ideology of rape. So actual rapists are the shock troops doing the dirty work in behalf of all men. And the man who condemns rape, in fact, covertly approves of and benefits from the practice. Thus, Mary Daly, men are demons sucking the, sucking the lifeblood of women, quote, like Dracula, the he-male has lived on woman blood. Women who do not share Daly's views are condemned as, quote, mutilated, muted, moronized, docile tokens, mouthing male texts. A lot of M's and a lot of alliteration in there. <clears throat> well, I, I, there are more examples, but I'll stop. Just as radical feminist ideology declared an identity between public and private, so law must eschew altogether any distinction between the intimate and the public, must breach any barrier of inhibition, shame, or taboo. There was, after all, proclaimed Andrea Dworkin, a, quote, Dachau in the heterosexual bedroom. So law had to reach into its interstices. Now, let me be absolutely clear. This went beyond any level of appropriate concern and punishment of physical abuse and violence to become an absolute catechism in which every sin became a crime, although the category of sin, of course, was eliminated, but you take my point. Law had to reach into the human heart, had to turn men inside out, and even then they could not be trusted unless there was a Klieg light shining on every deed so that any untoward thought could not usher into an action. All men were guilty as charged. A small step from that to punishing, as did the sexual harassment code at the university where I was then teaching, quote, unsolicited ogling. Now, I'm not sure what solicited ogling <laughs> consisted in. Uh, a friend of mine and I, she taught in economics, thought we would try to solicit ogling and see if we got any response and we didn't. Uh, <clears throat> there were also proposals. By the way, some of my male colleagues decided they would start wearing dark sunglasses at all times so they couldn't be punished for ogling, whether solicited or unsolicited. There were all, and humor is probably the best way to deal with some of this. There were also proposals, hence my Klieg light reference, uh, to cut down all the trees and bushes on this beautiful campus because rapists might be lurking there at all times. This natural greenery was to be replaced by Klieg lights so that all darkness was repelled, putting me in mind of the stunning and horrifying portrayal of Nazi Germany in the brilliant film, film Mephisto, in which the protagonist at the film's terrifying denouement is suddenly trapped as the Klieg lights come on. This is a kind of horrible excess and parody of the stage lights that he as an actor loves, and he's collaborated with the regime so he can continue to act. The Klieg lights come on, the sirens blare, and he is a captive of this all-seeing, all-knowing state. So every interaction then between male and female was to be policed. Now this fundamental mistrust of people, this loathing of the messily human, was a perverse mirror image of the uplifting of the ordinary I characterized as one feature of the rise of Protestantism. It's as if we were being told we trusted people too much, we certainly trusted men too much, and now we've got to clamp down. The upshot was that all of this made young women, in my experience, not stronger but weaker. How were they to feel up against what they were told was such a relentless, implacable foe. And this is what the law, certainly the campus law, told young women too, that everything must be regulated, that human sociality, or at least male being, was so thoroughly corrupted, nothing else was possible. So legal overreach makes people weak. It removes responsibility and, a, and an appropriate level of culpability. It puts everything into the hands of draconian codes and overzealous administrators and campus authoritarians and all the rest we know too much about. Now I have some other examples in here that in the interest of time, I think I'll foreshorten. 
uh, examples drawn from our elementary school playgrounds where, as you know, just this week there was another case of a little six-year-old boy suspended from school for drawing two smiling stick figures, he and his school chum, and he's shooting at his school chum, their little circles coming out of his gun, and it turns out he was representing a water pistol, and he and his friend are at play. But suddenly the child is a threat, he's suspended. This is the sort of thing I'm talking about. What at one point might have been a pedagogical occasion is calling the teacher, see if this little boy is obsessed with gun. Almost all little boys are, so you'd have to have every parent in there at some point or another. Almost all, not all. But at any rate, why turn all of these things into legal occasions, into litigious occasions? It's as if we're saying nothing any longer can be innocent or childish. All must be construed through the lens of forbidden or permitted, legal or illegal, and we really do think we can pry into human hearts. But again, legal moralism does not guarantee a decent order. It can, in fact, constitute a great disorder. Now, I realize it is too easy, way too easy, to draw examples from National Socialist Germany, which was in its own way a very legalistic society, with new laws being promulgated nearly every day to cover nearly every vice, including the vice of secretly harboring anti-regime notions, even though one had said or done nothing, which was a habit that Europe had already got into with the French Revolution and people being guillotined for secretly dissenting from the revolutionary project. So I don't want to do what's called an ad Hitlerum here, but there are aspects to Nazi law that should perhaps make us a bit squeamish. We all know about and deplore the race laws and the eugenics madness, but I'm going to report on something else, the astonishingly expansive public health laws of the Third Reich. Brilliant book by Robert Proctor called Nazi Medicine details this. Because German doctors had articulated the link between smoking and lung cancer in the 1920s, the Third Reich prohibited all public smoking, even by soldiers, pushed non-smoking for pregnant women who were to be mothers of the master race, for women who weren't part of the master race and were pregnant, there was another fate, pushed herbal and homeopathic and holistic medicine against the divisiveness of the Jewish science of modern medicine, forced prisoners at Dachau to tend to the largest herbal gardens in Europe in order to prepare these homeopathic remedies, pushed vegetarianism even as they were murdering Down syndrome children and other persons with mental and physical handicaps. All this is part of a great project of purification of making the body politic pure. We must cleanse it of taints. That puts me in mind of Mary Douglas, a brilliant anthropologist, of her book on purity and danger, sort of bringing back taboo under in this sort of legalistic structure. Well, why am I mentioning all this? Because the rush to become legally virtuous uh, in a totalizing way need not mean that a society is in fact virtuous. It may be anything but. I'm happy there's no smoking in this room, don't get me wrong. But when we get on a moralistic high horse about something, it does not necessarily signal how advanced we have become. And our own censorious totalists now want to go back and airbrush history into the classics of cinema and airbrush out the cigarettes. You know, bogey without a cigarette in Casablanca as he sits at Rick's Cafe that's both a sin and a crime. Um, once you start mucking about with film classics, you have gone a statue too far. We lose a sense of history and place, even as we pat ourselves on the back about just how advanced we are. When I was an eighth grader, we signed a pledge never to permit demon rum to pass over our lips. This following a dramatic display of the dangers of drink, when an earthworm was dropped into a glass of gin and appropriately and predictably shriveled up and died. <laughs> of course, water would have invited the same outcome, but one wasn't supposed to point this out. But the enforcer of that pledge was one's own conscience. Now, one of my 11-year-old grandsons this year had to sign a pledge at his school never to harass anybody. But harassment was left tantalizingly vague. Is sticking up for yourself harassing somebody. 
If in our political culture, those who take to the airways all the time, thinking of one film star who did this just recently, to proclaim they're being censored and marginalized as they're on television preaching to millions because someone has the audacity to disagree with them, it doesn't take much of an imagination to see an overzealous manager construing a vigorous disagreement as an instance of someone, probably alas, the little boy, harassing someone else. And it isn't one's conscience that's the enforcer now. It's this sort of lopsidedly sort of weighted structure with a kind of legalistic therapeutic administrative apparatus that we've invented and secured in our schools and universities and everywhere else. All right, one more example from everyday experience, and then I'm going to turn to Immanuel Kant and I hope um, I'm staying reasonably within the time limits. My example is going to be hate crimes. Uh, when hate crime legislation, why does that fit within my general thesis? I hope I can explain it. When hate crime legislation was first debated, I recalled in one of my medieval history courses, uh, my study of early medieval legal codes and the Frankish clans and tribes. It was a system called the Verguild, whereby lopping off the arm of the Lord was a far more serious offense than lopping off the arm of the serf. Arms were missing in each instance, but the one was a more punishable crime, a more severe crime than the other. So it seems to me with hate crime. Again, legalistic overreach. A person has been murdered, but we rank the victim morally and legally higher in our estimation if he is black, let's say, or homosexual, or from some other category against whom we believe hate crimes are most likely to occur. On what does the determination of a hate crime, as opposed to just simply having murdered someone, turn? Once again, prying into the human heart. Doesn't it suffice that a precious human life has been taken? There is an objective offense here, a rending of the fabric of the moral universe. Punish the crime of murder. If the victim is the white male CEO of an international global corporation, does his life count for less? than that of the gay man attacked on his way home on a Saturday night. A human life is a human life. We can never adequately plumb motive. There have been many who've tried all these books on understanding Adolf Hitler, um, understanding Stalin, understanding Ted Bundy. Uh, all these efforts come up short, perhaps because we have expunged the terms of discourse that might really serve us well here, namely evil or sin. Be that as it may, surely the important question is what did they do? Severely punish the deeds. As the saying goes, if the law could look into our hearts, none would scape whipping. So the moral equality of persons then, something that this sort of overreach in the case of hate crimes violates in believing that motivation in and of itself is an additional punishable offense an add-on to the crime of homicide. All right, let me turn to Immanuel Kant, who I think is one of the architects of a kind of legalistic overreach, and uh, give you an example from current international relations to show you how this regime of a kind of perfectionism uh, may function there or attempt to function. And as counterpoint to Kant, I'm turning to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the anti-Nazi uh, German theologian, hanged by the Gestapo, April 9, 1945, uh, for his part in the conspiracy to assassinate Hitler. And Bonhoeffer makes his argument in the name of Christian freedom in an essay, What Does It Mean to Tell the Truth?, that some have mistakenly construed as a piece of situationist ethics. It is not. Rather, it is a preliminary foray into the area of legalistic moralist moralistic overreach in the name of truth, an approach that Bonhoeffer links to Kant's severe deontological ethics. Now, Bonhoeffer reminds us that it is Kant who insisted one must give an honest answer to the query put by a would-be murderer as to whether his intended victim and one's friend is hidden on the premises. If the friend is indeed hidden there, one has no choice, for the prohibition against lying is absolute, but to reveal that fact and to give one's friend over thereby to the murderer. This invites Bonhoeffer's comment that the moralist at this point becomes a tormentor of humanity. 
This severity breaks sociality. It fractures friendship. It splits us off from the responsibilities of caritas. For certainly Christians face the prospect, at least those who put themselves on the line as rescuers did, that the scenario was none too hypothetical. Suppose the Gestapo knocked on the door. Is one's Jewish neighbor hidden within? Well, if you are a Kantian deontologist, you must say yes. You all know about the severity of the categorical imperatives. They cannot be modified. They cannot conflict with one another. There can be no taint of a consequentialist dimension. One lives in a very simplistic moral universe indeed in Kant's world. So the Jewish neighbor would be given over to his depredator. Now Kant quite unconvincingly when uh, some people criticized this said well perhaps a person could make an escape or not be found and that's pretty lame stuff. I think you'll agree. Um, in the name of responsibility, in the name of caritas, in the name of Christian freedom, Bonhoeffer says do not break the bonds of sociality. Do not deny the neighbor. There is more truth spoken by the school child assaulted in a classroom by a teacher who accuses the child's father of being a drunk and the child stoutly denies it, although the child's father is a drunk, Bonhoeffer argues, because the child is speaking to the truth of fundamental human social familiar relations that the school teacher ought not to be in the business of assaulting publicly. If you follow the deontological line and add to it some of the histrionic overreach I alerted us to earlier, including the eradication of any public-private distinction, then you are going to be in this legalistic nightmare where, as Bonifer says, everything has to have a placard on it uh, saying permitted or forbidden. Uh, I have another example in the interest of time. Perhaps in the Q&A uh, we can get to the area of torture and an argument that I made against uh, Professor Alan Dershowitz's uh, suggestion that interrogators should go before a judge and seek torture warrants to legally permit them to, to torture a terrorist suspect who likely has information that if revealed would save countless human lives. I use this as an, another example again of going uh, a bit crazy with the legalistic dimensions of all of this and removing it from uh, the realm in which I believe it is more properly uh, talked about. Um, again, in the interest of time, I'm going to pass that over, and I think pass over as well, my worry, but I'll summarize it very quickly, that uh, soldiering in the current U.S. context seems to be moving from a rule-governed activity and the just war tradition to one that is now excessively legalistically constructed. And we, again, seem to increasingly mistrust the capacity of ordinary soldiers to make decent decisions even under situations of horrific stress. Um, so that's the argument I make there. But let me get to um, my final example from Kantian ethics, and that's in the area of humanitarian intervention. And in order to say something about that, I need to remind you of Kant's famous essay on perpetual peace. Now, some of you have surely read this essay, and if you have, you'll know that for Kant, a mere truce, that is when people aren't fighting and killing one another, doesn't count for very much at all. Uh, for him, that's paltry, puny stuff. What you've got to do is to extirpate, he says, the will to war, entirely eliminate the intent. And then and only then do you have something that could reasonably be called peace. One worry here would be that this kind of argument argument makes the humanly possible work people do to make life less violent look pretty puny by comparison to extirpating the will. Now Kant offers a hard teleology whereby nature dictates thus and so. There's a kind of inevitability in the argument. The British international relations scholar Martin White warned uh, some years ago that followers of these Kantian ideals, quote, could be merciless and unrestrained they could see themselves as righteous agents of historic necessity, bringing about a better world. For this reason, White concludes that, quote, if you are apt to think the moral problems of international politics are simple, you are a natural, instinctive Kantian, end of quote. And as we all know, those who are in possession of a grand telos very commonly look askance 
at those of us who are more inclined to agree with Max Weber that politics is most of the time the slow boring of hard boards. It proceeds with great difficulty and slowly. So give, let me give you this one example, humanitarian intervention. It isn't a new thing. It's been talked about in one way or another for centuries. Here we might recall Augustine's sparing the innocent from certain harm as a legitimate casus belli for an outside party to bring force to bear. Current discussions of humanitarian intervention, I heard this just three weeks ago to form at Fordham, uh, Fordham University on the morality of exit from Iraq, heard this repeated, uh, stress right intention as the single most important criterion when we are making an assessment of the rightness or wrongness of a humanitarian intervention. It must be entirely, what's the motive? Humanitarian intervention must be motiv uh, motivated by one single motive, disinterestedness. Now, how so? Disinterestedness is certainly not entailed in the classic just war notion of right intention. There's nothing so severe as that. No probing to be certain one's motives are at one and entirely pure. The worry here is that if humanitarian intervention requires an a priori right intention criterion, as many of these international legal people are arguing, construed as disinterestedness, we are never going to see humanitarian intervention. Augustinian Christianity surely teaches that. For all human motives are mixed. We are limited, finite creatures who are never just of one mind about something. We will and we nil simultaneously. Absolute purity of intention you are not going to find on this earth. Now, humanitarian intervention advocates operating within this Kantian-infused perspective push disinterestedness with scant regard for the very raison d'etre of the state which is to protect its own citizens and to defend the national interest. And absolute disinterestedness would be, by definition, a grave failure of the state's responsibility, as grave as the dereliction of the parent who claims that he or she reckons his or her own child on an identical plane to the abstract category of all children everywhere. We would find something monstrous about that. Do mixed motives, then, disqualify humanitarian intervention? The People using Kant as inspiration say, yes, there can be no consequentialist consideration of any kind. All must be transparent, nothing held in reserve. Any appeal to one's own national interest is absolutely forbidden and sullies the matter, and you can't then legitimately engage in a humanitarian intervention. If we accept that all human motives are a complex admixture, a human humanitarian intervention is not perforce invalidated if it overlaps with other motives. Indeed, how could one possibly disentangle them? Now, when the hardcore legalists get hold of this, however, to disinterestedness is added a requirement that humanitarian intervention must be approved by the United Nations Security Council, which pretty much, much guarantees that nothing is going to be done. Now, let's conclude with Kant in this way. Um, or this section, I would say that it is as naive to believe that a purely humanitarian intervention is possible in the reality of international relations as to believe that an intervention that is not exclusively motivated by humanitarian goals cannot have a humanitarian effect. Remember, by their fruits ye shall know them. That's what scripture tells us, by their fruits ye shall know them. Now, there's much more that can be said, but let me move to conclude and remind you of some words from Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, appropriate surely here in Atlanta. At one point, at the height of the civil rights struggle, King stated, we're not asking you to love us. Just get off our backs. Just behave. Um, you don't have to convert. But guess what? By behaving, by adhering to a an alternative normative structure of the law, you might just convert along the way. Um, King's imagining, I think, a trajectory or the possibility of such that St. Thomas hearkened to altered behavior over time as we become habituated to new practices. Now, I want to acknowledge, before I conclude, one danger in the position I'm talking about. And to do that, I'm going to recall a famous exchange 
between Sigmund Freud and Albert Einstein on the question, why war? For Freud, wars occur because people haven't sufficiently rearranged their interior furniture. They're still driven too much by what Augustine would call the libido dominandi. Now, in peaceful times, this doesn't get put to the test. The law restrains reckless and violent behavior. But when the barriers are down, when we're in a situation of chaos, or when the law is, in fact, calling upon us to, uh, to go forth armed, uh, Freud tells Einstein, one learns who has truly been reconstituted internally and cannot find it in his or her heart to hate sufficiently to kill. For Freud assumed wrongly, I believe, that wartime killing was always accompanied by hate. And he says, you're going to see that the numbers of people who have become truly moral uh, is very few. He and Einstein were two such people, but said they're very few. Now, Freud, interestingly enough, thought he was offering with psychoanalysis a secular substitute for Catholic confession. But in the interior rising of the subject, he seems far more Puritan in many ways. And I'm not using Puritan in a, in a derogatory way here. Be that as it may, I submit that the democratic wager is such that we cannot base our law and our politics and our social relations on the worst case scenarios, which is what those uh, given to this legalistic overreach tend to do. All men are rapists, all human beings are beasts underneath, the patina of civilization is shockingly thin, and all the rest of it. We simply must make the wager most human beings, most of the time, are capable of minimally decent behavior, even if from time to time they harbor murderous thoughts. The law cannot get into those thoughts, but the law will run amok if it tries, and we will all be suffocated. And ironically, because we think the law covers everything, we may in fact let down our guard in how we actually form decent societies. So I'm going to end on that note of Christian freedom that Bonhoeffer lifts up, and Luther and St. Thomas as well. I'm going to conclude with a scene from one of my favorite books and films, To Kill a Mockingbird. It's a parable about the legal thing to do and the right thing to do. Now, this comes towards the end of the book and the film. As matters build to a climax, the sheriff of Maycomb County, having identified the odd and reclusive Boo Radley as a person who killed a drunk, wicked man who was trying to worry lawyer, uh, to murder lawyer Atticus Finch's two children, the, the sheriff is in intense conversation with Atticus. The backstory here, I'm sure you all know it, is that Atticus is defending an innocent black man accused of rape by the daughter of this racist drunk, uh, when in fact he's the person who's guilty of having beat her up and so on. And the accused black man, having been found guilty, tries to flee and he's been shot dead. So that's the backstory here. And then this vicious guy decides to punish Atticus for defending the man and goes after his kids. Atticus, sizing up the situation, his son with a broken arm and bruises, his daughter Scout, unhurt, having been carried home by the rarely glimpsed recluse Boo, assumes that it is his son Jem who grabbed the knife wielded by Bob Ewell, the drunk villain, and stuck the knife into Ewell, killing him during the wrestling match when Jem was trying to protect himself and his sister Scout. Now, as Atticus, who's always a lawyer, a very good one, staying within the language of a moral view of the law and responsibility goes on in this vein, Sheriff Tate, running out of patience, says, your boy didn't kill Bob Ewell. He identifies the shy, wounded Boo, at that point sitting on the porch swing with Scout, as the defender of Atticus's children and the person who dispatched Ewell. The sheriff continues, drawing upon a wellspring of theologically graced language as he speaks directly to Atticus. I never heard tell that it's against the law for a citizen to do his utmost to prevent a crime from being committed, which is exactly what he did. But maybe you'll say it's my duty to tell the town all about it and not hush it up. Know what'll happen then? All the ladies in Megham, including my good wife, will be knocking on his door bringing angel food cakes. It means in prison because Boo would have to be arrested and so on. To my way of thinking, Mr. Finch, taking the one man who's done you and this town a great service and dragging him with his shy ways into the limelight, to me, that's a sin. It's a sin, and I'm not about to have it on my head. I may not be much, Mr. Finch, but I'm still sheriff of Macon County, and Bob Ewell fell on his knife.
Good night, sir. Now, working with the sin crime distinction, this humble small town sheriff in this situation makes the right judgment. It is not, of course, the narrowly legal one. And it strikes me that it is, it's a judgment based on some grace, some mercy, a bit of saving slack in the order, if you will. And I think we should never lose sight of some of these distinctions, as we certainly do if we're pushing a heavy-handed regime of legal moralism and utopian overreach of the sort that legally proscribes minutia, doesn't trust people to handle uh, most of their own affairs, and undermines, it seems to me, uh, moral responsibility and freedom in the process. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Elstein, for those wonderful comments. I covered so much territory and did so eloquently, clearly, and succinctly. In fact, you had one more minute, <laughs> so you stayed within the, uh, in the time. Uh, the WCTU was quite active with these um, glasses of alcohol and the worms. And uh, the late Morris Abram was a speaker at our commencement ceremonies about 10, 11 years ago here. And he grew up in Fitzgerald, Georgia, a town about 150 miles south of here in the middle of the state. And had the same thing happened when he was uh, eight years old in the third grade. And the woman after the worm had died uh, asked if uh, any of the children had any comments. And little Johnny was sitting in the back had on pair of brogans that were two sizes too big and some hand-me-down pants that didn't even come to his ankles. He was very thin, this was during the Depression, and pale, but he had a big swollen tummy, like you'd see pictures of African children starving somewhere today. And she called on Johnny and says, oh ma'am, I can't wait to get home. I'm going to ask my mama to get me some whiskey because i got terrible worms. <laughs> and the moral of the story he was trying to tell was, be sure of your audience. <laughs> <laughs> before you start uh, making demonstrations. With this introduction about the problems of over-legalism and positivism taken to the nth degree, I think it only appropriate now that we turn to one of the caretakers of the law who takes care of all of our legal problems on a daily basis in his role as a United States Circuit Judge for the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Judge John T. Noonan is one of the most highly respected and best known members of the federal bench in the United States and a great intellectual leader in the law. His books on law include Persons and Masks of the Law, The Luster of Our Country, and Narrowing the Nation's Power. His books on the development of moral ideas include Contraception, Bribes, and A Church That Can and Cannot Change. He's been a member of the editorial boards of the American Journal of Jurisprudence, the Human Life Review, the Law and Society Review, and the Harvard Law Review. He's a recipient of many honorary degrees, and in 1984 received the University of Notre Dame's Light Array Medal, the highest honor bestowed on American Catholics. Please join me in welcoming Judge Noonan on this, his birthday. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction and birthday wishes. It's a great pleasure for me to be back here where I had the opportunity to teach uh, five years ago and uh, learn to appreciate uh, the energy and the intelligence that had gone into the formation of the center. And this afternoon, celebrating the center, my title is one center, two center, two centers, many centers. And my theme is the energy that has gone into this one center will expand by its power of exemplifying the general principle that it is fruitful to combine the study of religion and the study of other topics 
now conventionally separated from religion. Well, I would like to begin by focusing on the one center here and then go on to the other possibilities. And to begin with an old Latin line, tantum religio potuit suadere valorum. Such are the great evils that religion is able to excite. So Lucretius generalized from the slaughter of Iphigenia on the altar at Aulis in order that the Greek fleet might have a happy and hallowed start on its expedition against Troy. I read this line in a class at Harvard College in 1944 and it has stayed in my memory, a succinct reminder of the harms that can be done by religion or in the name of religion. A Latin aphorist might have made a similar statement about law. How many evils it has produced how many harms it does produce. I need not set out the catalog of crimes affected by law or done in its name. A similar saying could be coined of sex. How many evils it has produced. How many harms have been caused by it or are carried out to satisfy its demands. The truth is that no universal human activity is totally benign. If it is human, it will have repercussions and side effects and even central deficiencies that deform its practice and make the practice grotesque or hideous. Today, atheists are making a stir in Britain and America. Only recently, I saw on local television in San Francisco a program in which a noted British author lamented that in the time of Christ, there had not been a lunatic asylum in Jerusalem. The atheists arm themselves with a catalog of the crimes perpetrated by the religious or in the name of religion. Their evident message is, if only superstition, that is, if only religion, could be done away with, the world would be safer and saner. They ignore the crimes committed by such outstanding ex-Christians as Hitler and Stalin, and such non-Christians as Chairman Mao, and the Turkish rulers of Armenia, and the fact that the 20th century, the most secular in history, was also the bloodiest in its destruction of human lives. That same line of scripture that you heard recently quoted seems to me very apropos. By their fruits, you shall know them. Let us be sure what trees bear bad fruit. At this time of atheistic attack, it is peculiarly desirable that a scholarly center concentrate on two of the great enterprises of humankind, law and religion. 
and explore with equanimity the interactions between them and the deficiencies and difficulties that have marred these two analogous efforts to make sense of and give order to the conduct of human life. A center such as Emory, that Emory has now triumphantly established, not only permits the exchange of insights and fraternal correction, study at the center enables the scholar to identify the large contribution of law to the edifice of religion and the many building planks from religion that have given structure to the law. Are not the concepts of personal responsibility and of the human person theological innovations that have provided the foundations of our law? Does not the legal concept of agency permit a priest or minister to function in the name of God? Is not marriage in the traditions familiar to us both a legal and religious event? The legal ceremony and legal effects encasing the pledge of persons to one another in a commitment for life, a religious transcendence of the trans transitory flow of human emotion and expectations. Religion and law both deal in words. It has occurred to me, writing of the First Amendment guarantee of free speech, that all, or virtually all, religious activity could be subsumed under speech and given protection under this popular secular category as well as under the exact language of the amendment speaking of religion. Without words, religion is a dumb show. As for law, how can it be communicated or applied but by words? Law is not the policeman's baton is is the ordinance he enforces the rules that restrain his own conduct and the verbal propositions that follow upon an arrest it is on account of this dependence on words that both religion and law have proved to be resistant to any deconstruction depriving words of their stability and ability to transmit with tolerable clarity an idea from one human being to another. In a word, each discipline takes words seriously. Law and religion not only use words to shape stubborn realities. They are each, at least in our traditions, broadly understood, themselves shaped by realities. In the case of law, it is what human nature prescribes or permits. In the case of religion, revelation provides an additional structure in stability. In each case, 
the essential, non-shakeable core at the center, or the outer boundaries of change are not beyond argument. Each discipline has its fictions. Legal fictions are an established category of law. For example, the fiction of immigration law that an illegal alien imprisoned in the middle of the country, say in Kansas at Leavenworth, that that illegal alien has not entered the United States and so does not need to be treated as a person within the United States. Fictions are not a favorite term in theology, but do not favorite images of theology fit the category? In the most familiar of Christian prayers, the Father is firmly localized in heaven. In each discipline, the force of metaphor carries the mind beyond the physical reality of space. Each discipline plays a part in the other. Consider the fate of law if, as some jurists today try to think, law could be identified as a mere reading of bloodless print and conscience did not control and activate the reader. Consider what religion would consist in if there were no authority, no rules, no cohesive bonds framing the community. Religion then could consist in Emersonian meditation it would not be a message binding generations and continents. Each discipline has made contributions to the other by the offer of models or methodologies. Judaism and Christianity present a picture of authority that is a projection of the legal structure of an absolute monarchy. God is a sovereign, subject to no cabinet or parliament or court. He makes laws and judges cases as he sees fit. In Christian theology, he has a royal court composed of angels and saints. The latter act as courtiers, asking the monarch's kindness on behalf of their friends or clients. Of them, Mary is the chief advocate, not in the sense of being a lawyer, but of being an effective intercessor. There are no lawyers in heaven. The line has been drawn here on the projection of human legal images. In fantasy, the devil and St. Michael tussle for a soul, but the ordered verbal battle of the courtroom is not a feature of heaven. Theology, in turn, has influenced the shape the state will bear. God is sovereign, so his will cannot be challenged. The state is sovereign, so it is by its very nature immune from suit. It may graciously concede an area in which a court may hold it liable as the United States has done in the case of the Federal Courts Claims Act. 
and in some cases of civil rights. Its agents may be held accountable on the theory that their offenses were personal, not those of the office they held or the sovereign they served. The sovereign state is even today Leviathan, or God on earth, with the power to, rent, to make its soldiers risk death and the power to remove criminals from life. A power that today many Christian theologians reserve to God remains the state's godlike power of deciding when death shall occur. Add that the state has the divinity to decide who shall count as human and to exclude from this category of protected lives the lives of those whose humanity is inconvenient to admit. Law and religion have again interacted in the discovery that bribery is bad. Deuteronomy tells us that God in judging does not take a bribe. The judges of Israel are instructed to do likewise. The movement of thought appears to go from the divine case to the human. But one might suspect that the making of this momentous discovery, I don't know any true precedent, that the making of this discovery began with consideration of human judges and ended by projecting the human on to the divine. In any event, this interchange of law and theology has left a puzzle, perhaps better classified as a mystery. The response of God, a just judge, to the offer of his own son in sacrifice. Shakespeare has explored the question and perhaps offered a key in measure for measure whose insistence, where insistence on the letter of the law is trumped by an act of mercy that is redemptive. It is a sign of their affinity that their practitioners mock each other by assigning their own professional colleagues to the other field when they disapprove of them. <laughs> Thus Langdell was derided by lawyers as a legal theologian. And I've harbored the same thought about the master of federal jurisdiction, Henry Hart. Thus, a long and constant tradition in theology has attacked theologians as legalistic when they stick too righteously to the letter of the law. Partners in the practice of phrasing commands, differentiating situations, and bringing realities under verbal control, theologians and lawyers are quick to see the moat in the other's eyes. Well, all those thoughts bear on this center, but celebrating it, I urge the need for more centers that bring together religion and history, religion and literature, religion and science. And I should like to begin with one with which I am familiar, the Center for Theology and the Natural Sciences, CTNS, which exists 
in connection with the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley. Generously founded, uh, funded by the Templeton Foundation, CTNS has launched a series of initiatives to bring together scientists who are ignorant of, or indifferent to, or skeptical about theologians, to bring them into dialogue with each other, and it has encouraged theologians to take the plunge into areas that have never formed part of the curriculum of a divinity school. The enterprise has been comprehensive and ecumenical. Charles Towns, Nobel laureate in physics for his work in radar, is a board member, as well as Cardinal William Leveda, prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. How Galileo would have appreciated such an opportunity for collaboration and how much Urban V would have benefited from it. Consider what this center might accomplish if it added to its agenda a study of the new science aptly called the biology of the mind, a study coordinating theological themes and the new data. After all, Augustine's analysis of memory is an unforgettable meditation on the working of this elusive power. Have, have modern theologians nothing to learn from or to contribute to the study of brain cells? Knowing that when these cells stop functioning, thought itself stops is a knowledge that must play into any theological consideration of death and life after death. I think I'd better check my time to be sure I'm staying within the John Whitting limits. Uh, Always, I suppose, is the danger that religion will think itself competent to make judgments that depend upon data that religion does not have. Always there is the parallel, parallel peril that science will think itself able to inform human beings as to who ensouled them, who guides their paths, who has redeemed them, and who awaits them. The CTNS has to be a center studying limit. Let me imagine a third possibility, an institute in the study of religion and English literature with the acronym ISREL, Israel. Our literature and our religion for a long time went hand to hand and are not easily separable or understood apart from each other. From the Beowulf poet to Wallace Stevens, our literature has been drenched in Christianity. From Geoffrey Chaucer to T.S. Eliot, our poets have been inspired by insights religious in origin and in import. Beginning in the 19th century, a current of doubt and agnosticism has run strong. Representative writers in this current, from Matthew Arnold to Eugene O'Neill, can scarcely be understood without an appreciation of where they came from and what shaped what they became. And to take someone at the top of the literary tree, William Shakespeare, does he fit within this inviting area of 
combining religion and literature? Is it not he who, in Harold Bloom's extravagant phrase, is the inventor of humanity? Is not he the one saluted by Matthew Arnold? Others abide our question. Thou alone art free. We ask and ask. Thou smilest and sit still. In the light of Victorian agnosticism, the supreme poet was supremely free of belief. Unbelievers themselves, the critics would like to think that human beings can be free from any belief in their origin and end, and that there is a superior value illustrated by Shakespeare in being skeptical of saints and martyrs, uncommitted to any communion or creed. To the contrary, to penetrate the plays and the poetry of our greatest dramatist and poet, we must grasp the religious passions of his age, an age where eternal salvation was at stake in one's creedal commitment and where the wrong creed could lead to instant termination of life at the stake or on the scaffold. If religion, religious history, and theology may illuminate English literature, the study of literature complements consideration of avowedly religious texts. Without vicarious immersion in the passions displayed in literature, the study of theology can be a dull and dry business. Anyone interested in religion needs to know how it is played out in creative minds, as Jim Laney so eloquently said last night. A fondness for literature will not make you good. It will foster sentiments and enlarge empathy indispensable to theological inquiry. I could go on to enumerate possible centers of this sort combining theology with each European literature. I could go on to a center for the study of religion and history, but I do not need to multiply examples. My point is evident. The center here at Emory is a splendid specimen of the kind of study that goes beyond college courses and departments and with the care, money, and talent that have been invested here could be superbly replicated with vigorous variations throughout the scholarly spectrum. Thank you very much, Ed Noonan. You also left some time on the table. Quite remarkable to have two in a row in which the um, blue cards did not even have to come out. Uh, we are, have the floor now open for questions for a few minutes before we go into uh, the, the afternoon break. So if you have a question for either of our panelists or speakers, please come to the microphone. Bob Cochran from Pepperdine. Question for for Jean, the, uh, the phrases that you address, legalistic overreach yes. and legalistic moralism, are phrases that I think in recent years have most often been attributed to the religious right in this country. I was surprised you didn't mention that group, and I just wanted to see what comment you'd give uh, about the religious right. Well, um, the examples 
that I'm most familiar with, as I suspect you suspect, um, are those that take place within my own milieu often, and uh, that milieu is not dominated by the Christian right, as I'm sure you probably know. Um, so I think that we need to, uh, let me put it this way, it seems to me that there is a mistake that is made ongoingly that associates a kind of legalistic overreach only with people who have religious convictions and purposes. Um, so often the legalistic overreach of the sort I was criticizing that comes from folks who have no such commitments uh, are entirely secularist, if not, not just secular, but secularist, I mean anti-religion in many cases, uh, in their outlook simply gets ignored. It's as if we attribute this problem only to one group in the population, namely those with religious convictions, that they want to over-moralize the public sphere in a certain direction. And what I'm suggesting is that, in fact, um, this tendency to overreach, and we'd want to, if we were going to have a longer discussion about this, we'd want to proliferate examples, you know, is this an instance of that or not, as the case may be, and so forth. But uh, the point I was making, uh, certainly in my early part of my paper, uh, was that um, this aspiration to a kind of totalism of control, um, to a sort of purifying project, uh, comes in many varieties, not exclusively one, and that in focusing lopsidedly on those with Christian convictions and saying those are always the kind of people that want to impose their private views on us, which is usually the way it goes, even though if they're openly publicly debating it and thinking about laws, I don't see how that, but never mind, we won't go down, we, we won't debate that part of it. Um, but at any rate, you take the point. I mean, it seems to me important to point out that this tendency is not, you know, the exclusive purview of one particular group in, in contemporary American society. And it's an old tendency, and it's one with a long uh, history. And I think I pointed to some of, the, uh, some of the strengths, you know, that lay behind the notion that we could aspire higher, we could reach higher, we could expect more from ordinary people, and how that can, how that can turn perverse, if you will. Um, and the expectations can either be sent set so high they're impossible to reach, or alternatively, you get that uh, other side of the coin, which is we've trusted people way too much, we can't trust them, so we've got to compel, we've got to force, we've got to try to <coughs> peer into the interstices of the soul and see if we can clean things up. Over here. Yes, uh, I'm not a distinguished professor of anything, I'm a country lawyer. Uh, this uh, is always the prelude to a really difficult question, <laughs> this kind of thing. Well, I, you know, Sam it, Irwin, I, I detect I, some Sam Irwin coming in. Well, I, uh, <laughs> I am a country lawyer from Mississippi, not North Carolina, but, right. but, but I really love North Carolina. Um, what, in the light of this, uh, the Professor Elstein that yeah. you said, what do you make of Jesus and St. Paul having said that the law leadeth unto death and that it is grace? which yeah. leads to eternal life. Is it not true that a covenant of grace offers the world something that any covenant of law can never offer? Well, um, uh, yes. I mean, certainly, if, um, <clears throat> if you're talking about a covenant of grace um, and, by contrast to that, um, a kind of rigid adherence um, to a law that has perhaps lost whatever... Uh, moral raison d'etre it had at the very beginning, a kind of desiccated structure that one um, obeys in a kind of slavish manner. Uh, certainly, uh, the contrast can be drawn rather starkly. I think one of the things I was suggesting is that something of that covenant of grace or images of a certain a kind of mer merciful approach uh, that, that understands that everyone falls short of a certain perfectionist standard and that the law can recognize that as well, and that many of the things we now take to be legalistic occasions can in fact be different kinds of occasions, pedagogical occasions, occasions for parents as they once did, I think it's only my experience, sort of sorted things out if their kids had had a fight in the sandbox rather than suddenly having the whole apparatus of you know, codes and officers and this and that thrown into the mix. So <clears throat> I think one way to think about this might be <clears throat> we can't do that here, but 
<clears throat> excuse me, look at contrasting examples of societies that have gone through horrifically traumatic experiences and how they attempt to deal with that in the aftermath. Um, do you have something um, of the sort that the South Africans attempted with the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions? Uh, or do you launch into, and I know there's some criticisms of it because there's always going to be an issue of is justice being done appropriately and so forth. Where does the justice mercy line go? That or do you launch into a kind of purificationist project and you want to get every single bad person, which would include, for example, in some of the um, post-communist societies, post-1989, where hundreds of thousands of people collaborated with the regime <clears throat> out of fear. Uh, they were getting a little bit of money. They reported a few things on their neighbors. Does the law reach that far? In fact, <clears throat> the title for my talk was inspired by an experience I had uh, when I was in Buenos Aires, um, Argentina. I made about five trips there in the late 70s, early 80s. It was at the time of uh, the, of the so-called dirty war. Um, the, the, I, my first trip there was just as the third of three juntas were in power. Um, and then you had the restoration of constitutional government in 1982 under Raul Alfonsin. And I had encountered and then got involved with a group called the Mothers of the Plaza de Mayo, Las Madres. And as I made subsequent trips, the Mothers group had split in two. Um, precisely on these kinds of issues. The, the one group of mothers, um, they called themselves the Linea Fundadora line of mothers, believed that they had a stake in this fragile, new, imperfect constitutional order. And that you could not, in fact, because so many people were implicated, including lots of 18 and 19 year old kids, same age as some of their children who were tortured and disappeared, uh, murdered, uh, you could not punish everybody. You could not do it. And there was the other group that said we make no, we, we, we scorn any distinction between this new constitutional government and the juntas. They're all in cahoots. And we've got to go out and find everyone who had anything to do with it and punish them. And my friend, uh, she's, she's uh, dead now, Renee Abelbaum, uh, Argentine Jew who had lost all three of her children to torturers, when she was describing this, and why she couldn't support that severe line. She said, that, that is a search for a utopia of punishment. A utopia of punishment. And I thought that was a very haunting phrase, you know, about the cruelties that a certain quest for getting everyone who's guilty of anything can, can lead a society to. So I think you could, you could proliferate different kinds of examples where you've got the sort of covenant of grace and you've got the law and, and how do you sort that out? And how do you sort out the repertoire that's available internal to a society uh, for how to deal with these issues? Uh, Desmond Tutu told me in a conversation that, um, that he thought the reason South Africa had been able to move the direction that it did was because the vast majority of black South Africans are Christians. And he said that's not true of every society that's gone through this kind of thing. So, sorry, I, I'm sure you didn't think your question would unleash this torrent, but sorry. I, I fear that we do live in a closed and rule-based society oh. here. Is John Whitty coming And that uh, is Portia is not in the chair. Oh, there's lots of and people. And so uh, I'm going to have to call an end to this session, but invite those of you who do have questions to please come forward and, and, and ask right. the, uh, the panelists directly. And Frank Alexander will now give us some more directions about next steps. In order to get back on schedule cl as close as we can, we will take a break now. We will keep the break to no more than 15 minutes. We will begin the next session uh, here uh, by 4.05. So please uh, take a break, but join me in thanking uh, both of our panelists one more time. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.